All right, good evening and welcome to Birmingham 101, Blazing Through Birmingham's Past. My name is Kate Redden and I serve as a member of the University Programs Board. We are thrilled to have you tonight for the second event in our Magic City Adventure series. Magic City Adventures are events hosted by the University Programs Board in the Office of Off-Campus Student Services to connect UAB students to the Birmingham community because the Magic City is your home while you're at UAB. Birmingham 101 was originally created by the Leadership and Service Council in 2016 under the advisement of Mr. David Dada, one of tonight's panelists. Upon its inception, Birmingham 101 aimed to highlight the legacies of Birmingham's neighborhood through the lens of local high schools, which mirror the urban environment that they are built within. Today's Birmingham 101 panel aims to inform students of Birmingham's historical events during the civil rights movement and how those social issues are still prevalent among min minority communities today. First, we will have a presentation by Mr. Charles Woods from the Bur Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, where he will discuss historical events in the Magic City during the civil rights movement. Then we will transition into the panel discussion where our moderator, Tiffany Milan, will ask the panelists a set of predetermined questions about social issues, education, and ways you, you as students can work to make an impact during your time in Birmingham. Finally, we will end with a Q&A session where the audience will have the chance to ask our panelists questions. Tonight's event is being recorded and it will be posted to the Student Involvement YouTube page. Also, please click the link in the chat to mark your attendance on Engage. Thank you for joining us tonight, and I will now hand it over to the presenter, Mr. Charles Woods, Education's Programs Manager and Outreach Coordinator at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Thank you, uh, and greetings. Um, once again, my name is Charles Woods. I'm over Education Programs, um, Outreach, or, or as, I, as I like to call it, Community Engagement, as well as exhibitions at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. So um, if I seem a little tired, it's because I wear a lot of hats. I'm doing a lot of work. And so um, I'm here to give you all a brief presentation about the history, some of the civil rights history of Birmingham. Um, Birmingham was a very particular and special place during the civil rights movement. And a lot of things occurred here. So I'm not gonna be able to cover everything, but I will cover um, a, a lot of the highlights and really want to um, talk about a, a one special individual. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now, if that's okay. Um, oh. So it's not letting me share my screen. It's saying that the host has disabled um, me being able to share my screen. Is there a way that you all can give me a co-host? Um, yeah. And then I can see if I can do that. Can you there we go. Okay, it's on there now. All right, can you all still hear me? So I can't see anybody, okay. So the name of my presentation today is Still Some Magic in the Magic City. Um, Birmingham is known as the Magic City because of how fast they grew in the, um, in the 1870s. Birmingham was founded in 1871 and it was because of the steel industry that brought people here to the city. And the city grew to literally about 300,000 people in a very short amount of time. And so Birmingham is a very unique place. It's one of the few places in the world where all of the ingredients that you need to make steel, you can find readily available um, locally. So right here in Red Mountain, you're able to get steel, uh, iron ore, coal, and limestone, the three ingredients to make steel. And so that caused Birmingham to be a booming um, area and brought people from everywhere here to work in these mines. Now, if you were African-American at this time, you, um, a lot of people were newly free slaves. We had the Emancipation Proclamation came down in 1865. African Americans could feel what it was like to be a citizen of this nation. 1871, when the Birmingham, when uh, Birmingham was founded, the steel industry is what brought people here to this city and um, made this city a booming place. It was a lot of money in Birmingham at this time. And so blacks, as well as Irish and Italians and, 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 all, and all types of people came to the city looking for jobs and, and looking for that American dream. Now in 1871, when Birmingham was founded, reconstruction was still in full effect. 
1877, you had the Compromise of 1877 with Rutherford B. Hayes, <laughs> um, similar to what we're, 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 we're dealing with now or what we dealt with um, in, in Donald Trump's first run for presidency. But you had a president who um, won the Electoral College, but did not win the, the popular vote. Um, it was so close with that election that it had to go to the to the Senate to determine who was the president. And so Rutherford B. Hayes told the Southern states that if you allow him to be president, he will end Reconstruction and allow you to deal with your newly freed African Americans how you see fit. And that's exactly what happened. And so once Reconstruction ended, now blacks were really at the burden of these former Confederate officers and former Confederate soldiers who now were in control of the Southern states after Reconstruction. In 1896, you had Plessy versus Ferguson, which the Supreme Court stated that as long as you have separate but equal accommodations, then separate but equal will be the law of the land. What we understand though is that separate is not equal. And we'll talk a little more about that um, in, in just a moment. So I have right here the pictures of the, of the white and the colored drinking fountains. This is actually at the very um, start of the galleries at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. And this is our, our, our idea of segregation when we think about it. These signs on bathrooms, these signs on drinking fountains, and these signs on entrances into establishments. Um, once separate but equal became the law of the land and not just um, de facto or where, where people were just functioning in it, um, every Southern state decided to rewrite their constitution. The state of Alabama rewrote their constitution in 1901. We still have the longest constitution in the world because we just keep adding to it instead of amending or taking some of these things out. Now, once um, separate but equal became the law of the land, it, Birmingham became the most segregated city in the nation. Every aspect of life was segregated in the city of Birmingham and life was literally a living hell for the African-Americans here. One man um, particularly decided that he was gonna do his best to either kill segregation or be killed by it. This man is none other than Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth is from a place called Mount Meigs, Alabama, not too far from Montgomery. And he grew up there and went on to what is now known as Alabama State University uh, for college. He got his, his um, pastorship and ultimately was able to pastor a church in North Birmingham called Bethel Baptist Church. Fred took over that pastorship in, in 1953. And he was a special type of leader. He was one of those people that he required all of his congregation adult members to not only be registered to vote, which was like totally unheard of at that time, but also wanted them to be members of the NAACP. Now, I really want to talk about Fred. Now we know he the the, the airport is named after him, and 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 you may have heard his name before, but Fred is really one of these unsung heroes of the civil rights movement, and he deserves a lot more credit um, than he is given. He is a founding member of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And he is the founding member of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. So just talking a little bit about Alabama history, we're, and not to get into all of the, the intricacies, if you all have not been to the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, please check us out. We are now open Thursday, Friday, and Saturdays from 10 to 4, I'm sorry, 10 to 3 o'clock. So if you please check us out because you'll get a much more um, full history than what I can give today. Um, so Fred was a unique leader um, in the sense that he wanted his congregation to understand that the way Birmingham was structured would not, would not leave a future for uh, Blacks in his city. And so he was very integral in just about every major civil rights campaign during the civil rights movement. Um, and so the first thing that kind of thrust him when, I'm sorry, 1955, when the uh, Brown versus Board of Education came down and said that 
separate but equal is not equal and that especially in classrooms or schools separate but equal doesn't work and called it unconstitutional once fred found that, heard that the first thing he did was try to enroll his children into phillips high school he was met with an angry mob he was beaten bruised his wife was stabbed in the hip his daughter was was hurt but he was able to escape that situation and um this was right around the starting of when he created the alabama christian movement for human rights now the alabama christian movement for human rights was an organization that was founded by fred and other pastors in the city of birmingham to pick up where the naacp left off with the montgomery bus boycott the NAACP was um, asked by the state of Alabama to reveal the list of all their full roster, every member that they had and where they were located. And the NAACP rightfully um, declined. And when they declined, the state of Alabama filed an injunction that did not allow the NAACP to function in the state of Alabama. Fred Shuttlesworth being a member of the NAACP knew this and he did not want to lose any momentum with how successful the Montgomery bus boycott was. And so he created the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights to pick up where the NAACP left off. Um, the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights uh, was called that to let everyone know that this was a religious and a Christian movement to also separate themselves from what was um, pinning around that the civil rights movement was being led by the Communist Party. So he made sure he put communists in the name, I mean, uh, Christian in the name to separate themselves from that. And then also he talked about human rights. And at this point, this was kind of unheard of. Everything was about civil rights. And the fact that he called his organization um, human rights showed that he understood that these things will be bigger and broader than just being able to register to vote or being able to vote or being able to um, function as a full citizen at, in, in this nation. And so Fred Shuttlesworth was that leader on December 25th, 1956, yes, Christmas Day, uh, Fred Shuttlesworth House was bombed while him and his family were in it. Um, he says that after he put himself out because he was on fire and put his house out, he was able to get outside. And as soon as he got outside, a police officer ran up to him and said, Fred, I didn't know it would come to this. If I was you, I'd get my family and I'll get out of town. And he told him that you are not me. And you could tell you and your KKK buddies that they can't stop a man who is determined to be free. And that event solidified Fred's leadership as the leader of the Birmingham, of the Birmingham Civil Rights Movement. And so people deemed that event um, a miraculous survival and that, that solidified him as being the leader here in Birmingham. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. called Fred Shuttlesworth the most courageous man that he ever met. And one of Fred's many nicknames was the, the wild man from Birmingham. And one of his quotes was, God gave me a hard head because he knew I lived in a hard town. And that's just what Birmingham was. One of Birmingham's nicknames was Bombingham. And that's because that if you were seen as an activist or protesting, a lot of times your house could get bombed and um, or you could lose your home or you could have your car repossessed or you could lose your job. Um, the tactics that were taken in Birmingham to keep black people in their place were um, like none other across the country because they had a leader here in Birmingham by the name of Bull Connor, who was the commissioner of public safety. He was over the police department and the fire department. Now this picture right here is a, is a photo of members of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights and their pledge of nonviolence. Now nonviolence was the main tactic in the civil rights movement and the idea was to show that even though we're being even when you're being nonviolent, the violence that is being brought to you and you are not retaliating shows who is the bigger person in this situation um fred said that they, they it's, it's almost like you had to shame um white folks into understanding what black people were going through um but you had to sign a contract as a member of the alabama christian movement for human rights to say that you would be nonviolent. Now, like I said before, Fred Shuttlesworth was involved in every major civil rights campaign all the way up until King's death. But in 1961, you had one of the first major 
civil rights campaigns that ultimately came through Alabama. Um, in 1960, though, you had the sit-in movement that started in at North Carolina A&T University. And so with the sit-in movement, um, you had individuals from Fisk. So it started at North Carolina A&T University. Then you had individuals from Fisk University that picked up that model and began to do sit-ins themselves. Um, none other than John Lewis was part of that original uh, student nonviolent coordinating committee group who started the sit-in movement in Tennessee. Those sit-ins also trickled down here to Alabama with students from Miles College participating in sit-in movements as well. Uh, one of the major campaigns though that occurred in 1961 was the Freedom Rides. Freedom Rides started in, in Washington DC and their ultimate goal was to get to New Orleans. They did not make it there through the bus systems like they um, wanted to. They were finally flew in from Jackson, Mississippi to New Orleans. But once the Freedom Riders made it into Alabama, Aniston first, um, they were met with things that they were not really ready for. The Freedom Riders was a mixed campaign. You had seven blacks and six whites get on two buses in Washington, D.C. Um, once, once that Greyhound bus made it to Aniston, Alabama, they were met by an angry mob of KKK members and the, bar, the, and the bus was firebombed. Um, ultimately, everyone on the bus was able to get off, including two undercover U.S. Marshals. Um, but the bus did not make it. And so that was the first showing of what Alabama is willing to offer these civil rights activists when they come to this state. Um, once they got to Birmingham, it was another similar situation. Um, Bull Connor, the commissioner of public safety, allowed his officers to be off that day to be with their mothers. It was Mother's Day. And he also called his KKK buddies and told them, look, when these guys get in town, I'll give you 15 minutes and then I have to clean up the pieces. Um, and that's exactly what happened. The people in Birmingham on the trailways bus that made it to Birmingham were pulled off the bus. They were beaten very badly. Um, many of the members not able to continue uh, moving forward, but individuals like John Lewis, Diane Nash, other members of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee picked up in Birmingham and continued the Freedom Rise onto Montgomery. It is in Montgomery that John Lewis says it's the first time he ever had his head cracked open, being a freedom rider as they were met with another angry mob. Ultimately, once they got into Jackson, Mississippi, they were all rounded up and arrested and sentenced to Parchment Penitentiary, where John Lewis says he did um, several months of hard labor. Ultimately, Robert F. Kennedy sent a plane to Jackson and flew those individuals to New Orleans for a symbolic campaign, um, not a successful one. But what the Freedom Riders showed to the world was that Alabama, um, especially Birmingham, was a violent place. And if you're on the wrong side of that picket line, um, you, you were guaranteed to have that violence brought to you. Um, 1963 is probably the biggest hotbed year um, of the civil rights movement. Many, many things occurred during 1963 that ultimately led to the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and then ultimately the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But in 1963, early around in, in April, um, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth called Martin Luther King Jr. because they were both founding members of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and told him to come to Birmingham and to, let's try and, and end the, the racial segregation here in Birmingham. So King decided to come out. Um, King told a, 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 a full crowd at 16th Street Baptist Church the way to break Birmingham is that we have to fill the jails. And then he asked, who's going to jail with me? But the problem was is that the adults didn't sign on because they understood how Birmingham was and what they could lose um, seeing protesting in this city. And so the, the, the adults didn't volunteer, but the children did. And so King decides to go to jail. This is where he writes his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. If you have not read that letter, please read it. It's like, the, it's like he wrote it yesterday. Uh, very pertinent information. Um, but ultimately, the Children's Crusade was started while King was in jail. And they organized the children. And the children came to 16th Street Baptist Church. And in, in droves of 50, they were let out of the church. And they were arrested right away. Arrested right away. Arrested right away. Um, in the first three days of that campaign, you had over 3,000 children arrested. Uh, by day four, Bull Connor's trying to figure out how he can stop this madness. So whatever possessed his mind that 
he should call out Birmingham PD and the canine dogs and call out Birmingham Fire Department and allow those individuals to spray children with water hoses and sick dogs on children. It'll boggle my mind why he thought that was a good idea. But ultimately him doing that was the biggest push of the civil rights movement that anyone had seen up to that point. So in him trying to stop this movement, he actually pushed it forward more than he ever could realize. And in the eight days that the Children's Crusade last, you had over 7,000 children arrested and you filled the Birmingham jail, the Bessemer jail and the Jefferson County jail. And ultimately the business leaders of downtown Birmingham were willing to sit down with Fred Shuttlesworth, Martin Luther King Jr. and Ralph Abernathy to desegregate downtown Birmingham. Now, if you don't get anything else out of this presentation, you need to understand that it was through the effort of these children, these young people, these students who made lasting change in the city of Birmingham. And if those young people can do it, then the young people can they, today can do it as well. The youngest person arrested during that time was four years old. And so I tell young people all the time when I go out to the schools that if you have an issue that you are passionate about, don't wait till you're an adult to try and tackle that. Tackle it now. Tackle it now. Um, and so 1963, you have the Children's Crusade, you have the March on Washington that occurred in August, and the March on Washington was a happy point. That's where King gave his I Have a Dream speech. You had whites, blacks, Asians, Latinos, you had everyone come together for that march for freedom and jobs, and it looked like we were moving in a positive direction. And then less than a few weeks later, you have this event that occurred at 16th Street Baptist Church, where four little girls were killed in a bombing to protest to protest the integrating of Birmingham City Schools. The KKK put out nine sticks of dynamite, I'm sorry, 19 sticks of dynamite um, outside of 16th Street Baptist Church to protest the integrating of Graymont Elementary School. Just a quick footage of 16th Street and the Six Spirits Memorial on the Park. And this event of seeing these four little girls die at church of all places, which is supposed to be your safe space, really changed. It was the second push to the civil rights movement that occurred uh, that also happened here in Birmingham. People who were not involved in the movement now got involved. People who thought it had nothing to do with them now got involved. And people who saw that... Um, I'm sorry, I did something incorrect. And people who um, saw the funerals of those three little girls understood why it was import important for African-Americans to gain equal rights um, as members and, and citizens of this nation. Now, um, there are many other things that happened in Birmingham from 1964 on to 1968 when King was assassinated. Um, but I would love, want you all to come out to the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute to get that information. Right now, what I would like to talk about is, is what does activism look like now in Birmingham? Um, and the fact of the matter is that you have several issues that um, activists have been tackling or will tackle here in the city of Birmingham. And those issues are Black Lives Matter, uh, homelessness, disenfranchisement, which means that they're keeping people from being able to vote. Um, and then also just everyday things that, you know, people want to be able to, to live the American dream just like anyone else. And so, um, let me show this video really quickly of an aerial view of the Black Lives Matter mural that was created right here outside of Railroad Park. And Black Lives Matter right now has been considered a continuation of the civil rights movement and other um, Black activist movements that have come before them. And um, so let me go to my next slide. This is also some activists. Um, this is actually during the pandemic. Activists dememonstrating in the no peace. Here we said it, no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. When we said it, we did justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. What we gonna do? Shut it down. What we gonna do? Shut it down. What we gonna do? Shut it down. No justice, no peace. Because black lives matter. Black lives matter. We said it because black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Now, what 
one running out of time. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. This is a nice mural. Um, we own this mural now. This is the price. But it was a George Floyd um, video that really changed and opened up the ideas and the minds of individuals who have not been really paying attention to, to how African-Americans have been treated in this country over the years. And so with that happening in the middle of a pandemic, people being um, um, uh, sheltered at home and not working, a lot more eyes were on these issues. And so I have a slide here that just talks briefly about some of the other organizations. Okay, so that didn't that slide didn't make it. Um so some of the organizations that I wanted to highlight that people can get more information about, or if you're interested in, in activist work that you want to get involved, um, or uh, be a blessing Birmingham who deals with who helps the homeless population get water, showers, and food. You also have Woke Vote, who is trying to keep people from being disenfranchised. You have um, Black People Run, Bike, and Swim, which is an um, a physical organ, uh, a physical. I mean, a group that wants to get Black people and all people uh, physically active. Um, you also have GASP and you have, um, it's one more, but my I, that slide did not make the presentation. Um, and so if I could tell every UAB student one lesson about Birmingham's history, that would be that it was the young people, it was the youth that made the change. And so it shouldn't be any different today. If there's change that needs to be made, we need to focus on our youth, empower them, um, give them the knowledge that they need because they're the future leaders of this world. And as the future leaders of this world, they have to be informed and knowledgeable about where they want to lead us to the future. And, um, and it was the same way in 63. It was the youth that made the difference in 63 and it will be the youth that will make the difference today. I know I went over my time a little bit, but um, if there are any questions or anything, I guess we can get that later in the Q&A. And um, I believe that is my time. Now, let me figure out how to unshare. Thank you for your incredible presentation, Mr. Woods. My name is Tanner Caton, and I am also a member of the University Programs Board. I too would like to thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed Mr. Woods' presentation as much as I did. And I'm looking forward to hearing from our esteemed panelists. Now I would like to introduce tonight's moderator, Ms. UAB 2020, Tiffany Milan. Tiffany is a student seeking a bachelor's degree in business marketing from the UAB Collat School of Business, where she is also a peer mentor. After graduating, Tiffany aspires to work in advertising in the music industry. Since being crowned Miss UAB, Tiffany has worked diligently to ensure her peers and other community members understood the importance of voting. Tiffany worked to get her fellow Blazers registered to vote in time for the November 3rd elections, but she also encouraged them to share their opinions and make their voices heard. Now I will hand it over to Tiffany to start us off with the panel discussion portion of tonight's event. Hey, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for the introduction, Tanner. It is really a pleasure to be here with you all tonight, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from our panelists. I would like to start off by introducing each of our panelists. So first, we have Dr. Tondra Loder-Jackson. Dr. Loder-Jackson holds a primary appointment as a professor of educational foundations in the UAB School of Education, where she helped establish and formally directed the UAB Center for Urban Education. She also holds secondary appointments in the UAB UAB College of Arts and Sciences as a professor in the African American Studies program and in the Department of History. 
Dr. Loder Jackson is also a senior faculty associate in the Institute for Human Rights. She has worked on anti-poverty, anti-discrimination, and educational initiatives at nonprofit organizations, schools, and universities in Chicago, Illinois, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Loder Jackson Dr. Loder Jackson authored Schoolhouse Activists, African American Educators, and the Long Birmingham Civil Rights Movement, published by State University of New York Press in December of 2015. She was also named one of Birmingham Southern College's 2020 Distinguished Alumni. She was also named one of Birmingham Southern. Um, finally, as a Ramsey High School graduate, she spoke on the Birmingham 101 Ramsey High School panel in November of 2017. Welcome back to Birmingham 101, Dr. Letter Jackson. It's really nice to have you. Next, we have Mr. David D Dada. David Dada serves as a deputy director of the city of Birmingham Mayor's Office, the Division of Youth Services. He is responsible for the supervision and development of the DYS staff, as well as managing the implementation of the city's education and workforce development strategy for youth. Prior to serving in his current role, David served as a coordinator of leadership and service at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. This role allowed David to coordinate leadership development and civic engagement opportunities for the student body. David is a two-time UAB graduate, having received both his bachelor's in psychology and master's in public administration from the university. He is also a proud product of the Birmingham City School System and a 2007 graduate of Ramsey High School. David and his wife Katrina have been married since se September of 2016 and are the proud parents of two children, their son David III and daughter Davis. David serves as a mentor for Big Brothers Big Sisters and of Greater Birmingham, and as a deacon of the 45th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham's East Lake community. Welcome back to UAB, Mr. Donna. Next, I would like to introduce Sheriff Mark Petway. Sheriff Mark Petway is a lifelong Jefferson County resident and has over 27 years in law enforcement under his belt. He made history in 2018 when he was elected the first African American Sheriff of Jefferson County. Since being elected, he has implemented several programs that serve the community, including the Renewed for Reentry program. This initiative teaches nonviolent inmates new job skills to reenter the workforce. He also created Summer with the Sheriff, which is an internship program exclusively available to rising high school seniors that gives students an inside look at careers within the criminal justice system. Sheriff Petway has also partnered with Kickstart. At the end of each week, he visits locations throughout Jefferson County to set up food pickup stations where students and their families can obtain snacks and lunches for the week. To better connect with the people he serves, he launched a mobile app. Sheriff Petway earned a bachelor's degree in business administration from Faulkner University in Montgomery, Alabama. One of his biggest accomplish accomplishments is being a husband to his wife, Vanessa, and a proud father to his two daughters, Marquia and Gabrielle. Welcome, Sheriff Petway. Next, we have District Attorney, Mr. Danny Carr. District Attorney Danny Carr was elected in November of 2018 as Digi District Attorney for the 10th Judicial Circuit of Alabama. Before his election, Mr. Carr became the first African American appointed as District Attorney in the Jefferson County Birmingham Division, and he served as Chief Deputy District Attorney. His work began as a pros prosecutor with, with his office after graduating from Miles Law School in May of 2000. Since being hired, he successfully prosecuted thousands of felony cases in circuit, district, and juvenile courts in Jefferson County. Mr. Carr has been admitted to practice law in the Alabama Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court. He has also been admitted to practice law in the federal courts in the Northern and Middle Districts of Alabama. Mr. Carr has lectured and trained local police officers and sheriff deputies in the area of courtroom procedure, victimless prosecution of domestic violence cases and the criminal code of Alabama. He has served as an adjunct professor at Jefferson State Community College and professor of law at the Birmingham School of Law teaching criminal and criminal procedure. Mr. Carr is also a former faculty member at the National Advocacy Center at the University of South Carolina, where he instructs new prosecutors from all over the United States in various trial work areas. He is currently an instructor of criminal law and criminal procedure at Miles College School of Law. 
Mr. Carr served as a board member at the Western Area YMCA and City Program. He is a current board member at the Maranathan Academy, School for Risk at Youth, and Prescott House. Mr. Carr was selected to work with the Y Achievers Program sponsored by the YMCA. He was featured in the small business magazine regarding the opening of his barber and beauty salon in the Inslee area and his other community and civic work. Mr. Carr attended Council Elementary and Jackson Olin High School. He received his undergraduate degree from Alabama State University and his Juris Doctorate degree from Miles College School of Law. He is also a member of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity. In 2010, Mr. Carr was selected by his peers as one of the top 100 attorneys in the state of Alabama and the top 40 most influential males in Jefferson County. Thank you for joining us tonight, Mr. Carr. Finally, Mr. Charles Woods, our presenter from earlier, will also serve on tonight's panel. For the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'll ask our panelists a series of questions. Every question may not be directly um, to every panelist's experience, so there may be times where we only hear from one or two panelists. After I've asked the first set of questions, we will be, we will be opening up the floor for questions from the audience. All questions that you have will have to be submitted through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. If you think of any questions during the initial panel discussion, please feel free to submit them ahead of time, but we won't get to answer them until we are um, in the actual Q&A. So we ended the presentation talking about activism in Birmingham and ways to get involved. In addition to the suggestions that Mr. Woods gave, what can the average busy college student or citizens do to make an impact and become an active citizen? Well, I'll go ahead and jump in there. Um, the main thing that people can do is register to vote um and then vote um i don't really care who you vote for i just know that um during the civil rights movement it was a very concerted effort to keep african americans from voting i was one of those people i'm not originally from alabama i'm originally from california but i was one of those people before i got this position where i am now that thought that your vote really didn't count you know unless we were dealing with just local politics or you know some other things that your vote really didn't count it's not really one vote one person and then it took my my boss at the time to sit me down and say, hey, if they didn't want you to vote, why did they do all this stuff to try and keep you from doing it? And so right now, I think it's really important that if you want to be civically engaged um, as a young person that is of age, um, register and then and then use that vote. Yeah, I, and I let me just say good evening, everyone. And uh, I agree with um, Dr. Woods. I think um, voting is um, I mean, it, it, it is your voice. Um, it is your voice. And I often tell young people that, you know, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably on the menu. And uh, we've been on the menu far too long. And you need to have a seat at the table. And the way you get your seat at the table, even as a young person, is to make sure that you exercise your right to vote to have a say as to who will be your credible messenger. Because that person will be the person that will be your voice for policies, your voice for um, things and resources in your community. Um, is that person accessible to you? Does that person understand your ideology and, and what you want to see happen? So it's important that you realize the importance of voting and that you have that right because other people died and bled for that right. So don't take it for granted. Uh, make sure that you almost treat voting just like your birthday or a national holiday that you go to the polls, you wake up happy, you wake up fired up and smiling because you have this right because others sacrifice for you to have this right. And again, um, you know, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably on the menu. So make sure that you have the right person at the table. Absolutely. And if you're not registered to vote, you can visit vote.org and get registered there. Let's move on to the next question. So um, if you guys could teach every UAB student one lesson about Birmingham's history or the current social climate, what would it be and why? You know, I, and, I, and I'll jump in and say this, um, you know, and let me, and I'm just, I'm not saying, but, but like the words, I, I enjoyed your presentation, man. It was, I really did, I, I did. I mean, it was enlightening. Some of those slides, man, 
I mean, one for plagiarism, I want to get some of those slides, man, but <laughs> present that myself, I have one. Um, you know, I would, again, teach them, uh, we talked about voting, but also about the importance of human dignity, um, you know, being young. And I always tell people that human dignity is also a human right. And, you know, you have to understand how important um, not only your dignity is, but respecting others. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, if you want to get to where you want to be, then you have to understand and sometimes take the road less traveled. And if you want to be in a position of leadership, you have to understand that leadership is not about being right. It's about making things right. Those are two separate things. And sometimes when you're in a position of leadership, you think because you have the last word that you always have to be right. When in essence, it's not necessarily about you being right. It's about making things right. And sometimes when you want to make things right, it takes courage. All of those things go hand in hand. What Dr. Woods talked about, how Birmingham came about and all the struggles um, and all of the obstacles and all of the mountains that people had to overcome, that took courage. And nobody knew what the end result would be. But now we're looking at the end result and we're looking at people who are diverse, who came from the same backgrounds, who came from um, you know, disenfranchised area that are in positions of leadership. So as a student and as a UAB student, you have an opportunity to be whatever you want to be right now. You have the golden ticket. There are so many people that will want to be in your position. And there are so many people that sacrifice for you to be in this position. Take advantage of it and be our next leaders because, you know, uh, Dr. Jackson, Dr. Dada, Dr. Woods, and Sheriff Pelway Wood, and myself, we won't be here forever. There will have to be new leaders. And you want to be able to take that mountain and have the courage to do it. And it's not easy, but it takes courage and you have the ability to do it. And now is that time. Uh, really quick, I just want to jump in there and say thank you, okay. uh, Danny Carr. But really, really quickly, I just wanted to say, and that I didn't mention earlier, is the fact that the things that occurred here in, in Birmingham in 1963 with the Children's Crusade, that became the blueprint mm -hmm. for protests moving forward. They still use that blueprint today, and 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 other countries have used that blueprint all over the world. So you, we have to understand that that we, we we're located in a very special, hallowed ground, sacred space place living here in Birmingham because everyone is trying to do what they did here so far back, you know, fifty years ago. And so we also have to recognize that the world is watching us. And so here in Birmingham, we need to be the ones to be able to continue to be that blueprint or that example for the rest of the nation on how to deal with these issues. And so what that what that takes is people have to be informed. You, you, if you don't know your history, you're, you're bound to repeat it. But also part of knowing this history is recognizing what they did, what King and Shuttlesworth taught those young people that they internalized and passed around the rest of the nation so that we all could be free. Or, or let me say, let me not say free because we're not free yet. So that we all can have some freedoms, okay? Because we're still looking for that full, um, for everyone to be free, equitable and equality and all that stuff. So we, we still got a ways to go. Um, I want to jump in. I want to share uh, some pearls of wisdom from an activist from Alabama, Miss Ruby Sales, and I heard her recently on a panel, and I met her years ago, but she was born in Jemison, Alabama. For some of you who may not know, I know Mr. Woods and others know about Ruby Sales, but she was a member of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And she was almost killed um, after protesting and being released from a jail in Haynesville, Alabama in the 60s. And a white Episcopal seminarian named Jonathan Daniels actually pushed her out of the way, took the bullet for her, and was killed. And so at a panel recently, Ms. Sales said that for any movement to be successful, it must have hindsight, insight, and foresight. And I really took some time to think about it. So one lesson about Birmingham's history that I think every UAB student uh, should learn follows those three parts of Ms. Sales' wisdom. Hindsight. So students should study 
the history of the city and its social movements. Um, you study it through uh, secondary source documents that you get through mainly through your professors and on your own. And then uh, Mr. Woods has introduced you to some primary source documents. Insight. And to me, that means you should be thoughtful and reflective and strategic about what your own role is in uh, making history in the city. And then with respect to foresight, envision and fight for the city, the state, the country, and the world you'd like to live in, and the world and the city that you'd like to bequeath to future generations. It's important to keep dreaming and envisioning about what is ideal and fighting for that. And you will fall short of that. We, you don't ever quite get to the ideal, but you don't want to become so cynical that you don't continue to dream um, and envision what you'd like to see. And uh, thank you. I definitely want to echo everything that's already been said and something else that I would like to share with all UAB students. Um, this is actually something that I read from a, our UAB's fourth president, Dr. J. Claude Bennett, was a medical doctor, but also was a, a Birmingham native. He was from West End, graduated from West End High School. And I learned about uh, him and just the history of our university in this book is called uh, New Lights in the Valley, The Emergence of UAB. I would highly recommend it to any UAB student or alum, just anybody from Birmingham. Like it really showed me a lot. But uh, Dr. Bennett, UAB's fourth president said this uh, 25 years ago in 1995. He said, we have expended much institutional energy considering the question of whether UAB is an urban university or a university in an urban setting and trying to understand the implication of each possibility. The fact is UAB is and must be both. We have a blended mission. We must be both in and of Birmingham. So I would just say like you come from, you go to a university that has like community engagement like at its core. So don't like, don't lose sight of that and like step fully into like what that, you know, the, the opportunities and responsibilities that gives you. So I would highly recommend that. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing. I will definitely look into that book. Um, let's move on to the next question. So how does Birmingham civil rights history continue to impact day-to-day -day local politics um, in 2020? I would like to chime in on that. And I uh, would like to repeat something that um, uh, Mr. Wood said. And uh, he talked about how the children uh, led the march, how the children led uh, the change. And um, that was something that was huge. And um, when the children left the schools, Parker High School in particular, um, that was huge. Uh, my parents talk about that all the time. And um, we grew up here in the city of Birmingham, but I was not born here, but I grew up here. And I heard a lot of the stories, but also when the media caught hold to what was going on, it brought about a change. And, and, it, and that brought about the shaming that Mr. Wu has talked about, the shaming. But nowadays we have social media, which is more effective than the media they had back in uh, the 60s. And you're talking about shaming someone into doing something that was very powerful the pictures uh, that was shown of Bull Connor uh, with the water hoses and the dogs been sick on, on the kids and everything. Uh, those are powerful images. Um, they are still being displayed right now today. They are still causing people to feel what happened back during those days. No, those images are very powerful even right now today. And that, that, that shame, that brought about a shame on Birmingham and that caused a change from the commission form of government to the, uh, to the uh, council mayor form of government, changed government after all of that happened. So that was a powerful change that happened during that time. And, and I would just chime in and just say also, um, <clears throat> when you're even talking about politics during COVID time, I think it honestly um, allowed us to look locally and nationally at, um, the different voter suppression efforts that have been going on. Um, we started, you know, there are so many court challenges about early voting efforts. You know, whether we have curbside voting, whether or not people, you know, absentee ballot efforts and the importance of people who are elderly um, who 
was um, at risk of going to the polls and we started trying to um and, and Chair Pewe and I had conversations about it obviously because it affected us on how important it is to have different methods of voting and um if you look at and I forgot what it was an article and I, I hate I didn't I don't recall the name but it looked at each state's voting efforts and Alabama was the state that got an F and that was a recent article um, so, you know, looking at all of the things as it relates to voting and, and all of the, the way and all of the, 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 the voter um, absentee balloting efforts and things that we had to go through, um, all of the stuff back and forth relating to whether these votes will count, whether this court will allow these signatures or to count. All of those things gave us a true sense of the voter suppression efforts that are still alive today. And um, I think we have to keep our eyes on that. Uh, one thing I'd like to add to that question um, is that the efforts and the things that occurred in Birmingham, especially in 1963, um, changed the relationship between, let's say, like the, the city government and the, and the community. So let's say, for instance, when I first got to, to um, the Civil Rights Institute, we did a program called Hand and Paw with Service Dogs. And it was a service program for individuals who were um, sprayed with water hoses and dogs sicked on them in the 60s. And how that residual effect from that traumatic experience has trickled down generational in their families. And so we had to get old people, we had to get young people all come together to pet this dog because grandma was sick, dogs were sick on her when she protested and it affected her so much psychologically that she's definitely afraid of dogs and she passed that fear on to her children who passed it on to their children. And so I say all of that to say that there's always some type of residual effect to everything. And one of the residual effects of 1963 that occurred, I mean, that happened in 1963 that, that, that is residual now is the fact that um, we haven't had, and I know that there's that one incident when that young lady was killed. That was before I got to Birmingham. I know a lot of people that's from here remember that. But besides that incident, I don't know of any other incidents where you had a significant um, police brutality situation towards the citizens or a killing or anything like what we've seen in social media today. And I like to think that that was because of how the police functioned in Birmingham in the 60s. And how future, like Johnny Robinson, who was the first chief of, chief of police of Birmingham, and other individuals who witnessed those types of things and said that'll never happen in this city again. And so Birmingham being one of the earlier places that were dealing with um, a community type policing is one of the places where I think uh, Birmingham is like 70 something percent African American. So they make sure that they, that they police department, the fire department, and all these other agencies reflect that demographic. And I think it's those types of things that have that that people nowadays don't want to repeat things that happened in Birmingham's past. And so I think um, the whole Children's Crusade is one of those things that kind of plays out into in the day to day politics today, because we don't want people to have a hate for the police like they did then. We don't want people to fear the police like they did then, and we also want people to be actively involved in the decisions that are being made in their community. And so I think people don't want to go back to how Bull Connor was running this city. People want to keep moving forward from that. All right, well, thank you guys so much. Um, that was our last question for the panelists. And uh, we're now gonna move on to the Q&A session where the audience will ask us some questions. Um, we're gonna try to get as many questions as possible, but out of respect for everyone's time, we're gonna try to ask the final question um, by about 7.50. So if you have a question for a specific panelists, um, please note that by typing like, for example, uh, for Dr. Letter Jackson. So just at the beginning of your question. And it looks like we already have one waiting for us. Um, so this one is um, directed towards uh, Dr. Loder Jackson, but please uh, feel free to chime in. Um, do you think that colleges and universities should require academic courses related to marginalized groups, history and or issues? For example, including courses like African-American studies or Latinx studies in the curriculum. Okay, and I, I appreciate 
uh, that question, probably my answer is going to be uh, obvious. So as, as a professor who holds uh, uh, primary and secondary appointments in education, history, African-American studies, and at the uh, Human Rights Institute, my answer is certainly a resounding yes. Uh, we are well past the time um, as a nation of requiring all students to understand their fellow uh, neighbors uh, with much more substance and depth. So in a state such as Alabama, I think our starting point should be to study the cultures that help to establish this state. So indigenous Native American cultures, Africans in America. And we should also require our students to understand how slavery shaped black and white poverty and white wealth in this state and the Southern region. Um, um, there, it's, it's important, I think that will help us understand some of the social class dynamics in the state of Alabama and this region if we understand uh, white poverty as well. We need to have a better understanding of the agency of African-Americans in Birmingham in the 19th century and the or early 20th century. They established banks, schools, funeral homes, burial societies, civic organizations, social service agencies. So we need to understand that uh, African-Americans in Birmingham were, were not just victims, uh, they, they, they were agented. And we also need to understand the history and culture of white immigrants and their transition from being considered Irish, German, Italian, et cetera, to being considered white. We need to understand that dynamic. I was telling a UAB colleague in African-American studies today who presented some research on tensions between Haitians and Bahamians, uh, both of, 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 of black heritage, if you will, African heritage, but tensions in the Bahamas between Bahamians and Haitians. And I was telling her that everyone in the, in the United States and certainly in Birmingham and the state of Alabama needs a primer on intercultural diversity. So not all people who appear black or brown identify with race in the ways that we construct race in the United States and certainly in Birmingham. So we need to have a more nuanced understanding of race and ethnicity, nationality, uh, social class. If we have that, we'll have a better understanding of a whole host of things, uh, namely voting patterns. Um, we have to quit assuming that certain groups are going to vote a certain way. I think we have to quit assuming uh, that because uh, African Americans tend to vote as a block as it relates to race matters that we agree on things because we don't, if you visit any historically black college or university or a black church or civic association, you will witness quite a bit of diversity, quite a bit of tension and sometimes uh, conflict, but you'll have a diversity of black political thought. Uh, so we, we really just need to better educate ourselves, not just the young people, but the adults as well. And so, yes, I am definitely a strong advocate of uh, so-called ethnic studies, uh, gender studies, and um, the Holocaust, a whole host of studies that will help us understand one another and hopefully chip, chip away at uh, some of the divisiveness that we've seen uh, more and more lately. I'd like to piggyback off of that really quickly. One vision that I would have and, and what uh, Dr. Lorda Jackson said was phenomenal. You, you touched everything that I couldn't touch because I talk really fast. And um, But you, you touched on everything that I really wanted to say that I couldn't say. But I would love to see this class in a, in a, in a whole encompassing um, American history course. Um, the problem is, is that we keep thinking that Black history is Black history and then American history is over here. Latinx is Latinx history and then American history is over here. This is all American history. This is all United States history. We, um, we are all in this together. The problem is, is that over all these years, especially when I was growing up, it seemed like they taught everything from a white perspective and then they did not include the other groups. I grew up in California. The only thing we learned about Hispanics, which they're all around, they were all around me growing up. The only thing we learned about them was the missions, the missionaries and the and the indigenous people don't even they didn't even talk about how California used to be part of Mexico, right? 
they made it seem like it was a Native American issue, which I mean, they these are the Native Americans, but that was part of another country. And so they they we got to stop these silo histories and start figuring out where the dots connect and put all those connected dots into one um, type of presentation. Thank you so much for um, touching on that. Um, our next question that has come in is for Mr. Um, Dada. Can you talk a little about what it means to be an active citizen and why it is important for students um, to be involved? Absolutely, absolutely. So I think that um, like what it means to be an active citizen is that you you see the role that you play in the society around you. You don't like just say like, oh, that's someone else's job. You know, like I know that um, everyone here has said like the youth play such a huge role in the future of our country, which has always been the case, but like people need to know that and like own that. Like we can't wait to, um, yeah, you can't really wait on someone else to do that for you because it's like, uh, and that's with the voting as well. Like, cause even like, like it's been said already, if you don't register to vote, if you kind of just see like, well, I'll, I'll wait till I get older to do that. There, uh, there was a quote that I saw and it was talking about voting in particular. And it said, uh, even choosing not to play affects the game. Like, so even if you say like, I'm not gonna do that, then you like, you literally will like, people will ignore you then because one of the ways that power is uh, distributed is like in attention to like who's voting. So, um, so yeah, so being an active citizen is just like, you know, again, paying attention to the world around you, seeing kind of what, what issues really connect with you and then playing a role in that. And UAB offers so many opportunities to do that. So like you said, what ways can students get involved? I mean, you have the Office of Student Involvement and Leadership, you have multiple academic programs, you have multiple service, not just service days, but like service organizations that will let you develop like a, a really ongoing relationship. So I would say that, and then also seeking out like internships, seeking out ways to, to shadow people. You have a lot of great leadership represented here. You got the Civil Rights Institute, the Sheriff's Office, the District Attorney's Office, the um, School of Education, African American Studies. So you just, just don't, um, again, don't feel like you gotta wait till you get to a certain level of importance to start making a difference. Cause you can do that, that right now. Like that's really, I honestly love the way that UAB students already like do that. And I feel like there's just a lot of opportunities to do that even more. Like you all have so much, um, so much power. And I don't use that, I don't think power is a negative term, right? I think it can be, as long as it's wielded for good, I think you have a lot of power. So you should you know, use that. Absolutely. And for all of the students out there, there are plenty of ways to get involved at UAB, uh, like with the student and leader involvement. And there's a bunch of organizations that you can get involved in. And if there's not one that you might like or think that is for you, then you can definitely make one. So we're going to move on to the next question. Um, as we saw in Mr. Wood's presentation, there was a couple of different um, art murals. So there are several art murals throughout the Birmingham area as well. Do you guys think that art plays a role in unifying our community? And if so, how? I'll um, chime in on this one. I think art is very important to uh, really, really art is, is, is established and here for us to be able to have those difficult conversations without maybe necessarily having the conversation right then. Um, art allows you to expand your mind, allows you to think outside of the box. It allows you to put yourselves in somebody else's shoes. Um, all of these things you get from experiencing art. And so with the murals or with, it's, it's so many different um, murals and, and, and different art that came out during this pandemic that came out um, during or right after the, the George Floyd and the Breonna Taylor situations. Um, and that's because it's, it's, a, it's an outward expression of an inward feeling. And anytime you can, you can give an outward expression of something that you, that's going on inside that'll help spark um, conversation, that'll help spark um, much needed um, exchange of ideas and things of that nature, um, I think it's very helpful. And honestly, sometimes it's the only way that people that that people can come together to have those discussions and those conversations because you're really just kind of like focusing on the art, but it's really some underlying in, uh, principles and things that um that will come out in the discussions and conversations just from viewing certain particular um pieces of art. And so like at the institute, we have art, we have statues, we have sculptures, 
We have all kinds of different things throughout the building that is just for that, just to kind of spark like, well, why is this here? Or what is this about? And just to get that conversation rolling so that we can, you know, get to an end. And so, so I believe arts is a, is a very strong means um, to an end. And I would say the cultural arts in general have just been a part of social movements throughout time. Um, so you, in, in the 60s, you had um, uh, poets, uh, people, um, um, uh, some of them, their names have changed now, but I, I knew them with uh, as different names, Don Lee um, and, and so forth. But um, they, the poetry, the um, writing of James Baldwin as an essayist, literature, um, um, and, and certainly artists. Uh, there's an art exhibit at our Birmingham Museum of Arts. It's featured Jacob Lawrence. Uh, it's, I know it's a shame that how the pandemic is impacting us being um, in places physically, but uh, it is, it has opened recently. And Jacob Lawrence, a lot of his art uh, really spoke to social movements. So I, I, I can't say enough that that is critical. And we know during the civil rights movement that Dr. King and other leaders partnered with Harry Belafonte and um, other um, um, artists, if you will, um, celebrities to fight, to raise money uh, for the movement so that it, the arts are very central to any social movement. Yeah, you got Joan Baez, uh, James Brown. Um, it, it was a lot of- yes music art especially during the 60s that um spoke to a lot of people and got people involved a lot of, you That's know right. even now even now these artists you know that are socially active i guess you could say that woke woke folks um help bring other people up who ha who who have not done the the work you know or the knowledge or the research to fully understand but they can they can get behind a celebrity or or an artist or somebody that they are comfortable with that they've been following you know what they've been doing and say like oh this is something i need to pay attention to and that, that um, is so true that's i mean so john legend alicia keys common there when you think about the movie selma um so it's it's it, a, a lot of filmmakers today and i know in that instance ava uh, duvernay they you can tell that they're trying to bridge various generations because the content of the film is historical, but yet they bring in contemporary artists to sing certain songs. I was watching, um, I don't have Netflix, but I was watching this uh, show that's about uh, Madam C.J. Walker. And I, I just noticed how they bring some contemporary elements showing her boxing in a boxing ring to really try to help current generations connect with that historical content. And art is important to do that. Absolutely. So um, I guess another question that just came in is what is one thing about Birmingham that you are the proudest of or that has impacted you the most? I would like to share something about Birmingham that I'm very proud of. I was in Washington, D.C. last year and I took a tour of the Black History Museum up there and I saw what they represented Birmingham and then uh, the museum up there. And that was my community where I grew up in the Smithfield community. I was so glad to see the Smithfield sign uh, in the museum and being represented there. Um, now, I grew up right around the corner from someone who was a big activist and, and that was Angela Davis. Uh, I never met Angela Davis. I knew her mother very well. Uh, I grew up here in the 60s grew up right around the corner for Angela Davis, but I'd never had a chance or opportunity to meet her. But uh, I remember her mother very well. Um, I uh, was able to tell a lot of the, the people at the museum that this was my neighborhood. This is where I came from. I was so proud of it to see the sign there in the museum up there in Washington, DC, just to see where I came from being represented. And it meant a lot to me. I agree with uh, a share of Petway, J just the national and international uh, renown uh, that Birmingham has is, is pretty powerful. 
I can sit down. I, one day I was watching a PBS documentary about John Coltrane. So I'm just enjoying it. And I had no idea they were going to have this little montage focused on Birmingham because he had one of his songs is, uh, I think it's, it's called Birmingham, if I'm not mistaken. But I mean, it's just almost anything you can sit there and you're watching something and Birmingham appears. I know sometimes people get frustrated with the perpetual images of the of the dogs and the fire hoses, but that is a part of our history. But people just look at the city as, as this place to learn about how to work out hard history how to work out tough issues. I love that in Birmingham, we had the Black Lives Matter activists and the civil rights activists really dialogue, having a dialogue with one another about what they appreciate and then also being honest about some of the tensions they have. Some of that bubbled up when a few of the activists wanted to rename a portion of 16th Street, uh, uh, they wanted to rename that Black Lives uh, Matter Boulevard. And then you had some other Black Lives Matter activists who said, no, we, we, we don't need to do that. So it's just, it's just a place where we work out a lot of messy issues. It's not always pretty. Um, some people think that's negative, but I think we're honest about working out race matters in this city. One other thing I'd like to share about Birmingham, uh, especially back during uh, the time my mother was coming up here in the city of Birmingham, she would talk about how they had a great mass transit. They had trolley cars right here in the city of Birmingham. Birmingham has really changed. I mean, somebody came and they just took a good idea and just covered it up. The tracks are still under the streets right now. Just think if we still had those trolley cars uh, that can transport you from one end to the other end of the city. She talked about how she would go from Inslee uh, to Parker High School and how they would ride the trolley car. She'd get the name of the car and everything and just talked about the beauty of, of the city. And if you look at some of those old pictures, you can really see the beauty of Birmingham, uh, places like Inslee and uh, downtown Inslee and uh, Birmingham. Uh, th those places uh, uh, have a lot of historical buildings uh, a lot of history there, uh, the steel plant, uh, just the whole makeup of Birmingham is it, really changed. But uh, back in those days, you could see a lot uh, of, of how these people got around just using the trolley cars and everything. It was it was awesome. I wish we had that today to be able to show today. And I believe uh, Larry Lightfoot was trying to revive that uh, by tearing up the street. He wanted to tear up the streets and bring those trolley cars back here again, and that would have been great for, for Birmingham. It would have solved a lot of uh, problems with mass transit. But if you go back and look at the history of Birmingham, you will see a whole lot of difference with the mass transit and the way we got around and some of the old buildings that we had here. They were beautiful. Uh, Birmingham is a beautiful city. I just want to chime in and tell everybody I'm sorry I have to leave. This job never ends, unfortunately, but I appreciate the conversation. Thank you for having me. And I want to leave the students with this. Just remember, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. Remember <laughs> that, all right? It's what you learn after you know it all that counts. So thank you and I appreciate it. God bless you all. And in regards to uh, just answer your question about Birmingham, just one of the, the things I love about it is just the feeling of like community. Like um, again, being born and raised here, like um, it's just like a it's like a family, you know. Like I know even one of the first questions I get asked when I tell somebody from Birmingham is like, "Where did you go to high school?" And then like uh, Sheriff Petway said, "Oh, all, and I, as soon as I say Ramsey, they're like, oh, all the smart kids went to Ramsey, and they'll tell me where they went." And it's like kind of, and that happens, you know. What I mean, folks say they went to Parker, and then like, okay, when you mention Parker, like that's one of the that's the first black public high school in Birmingham. So then, it, if you if you meet an African American person that's probably at 60s and up. Like I say 70s and up maybe, and you ask them where they went to high school, if they went in Birmingham, it's probably gonna be Parker because that's the only place they could go. And it just, but there's so much like culture there that like I remember being in high school, being at the free throw line, we're playing Parker in a basketball game. And I hear this, I hear somebody booing me and just saying all kinds of, not cursing, but just booing me very heavily. And I look to the right and it's just like, lady had to be like 80 years old in like a Parker high shirt. And she was like, I hope you met. And it was just, it was cool though, because I was like, man, this lady is really out here on a Tuesday booing this 17 year old because she loves her school that much you know and it wasn't personal but it's just I love that I, I love that about the city I think I always love that just like you know the pride 
so I'm I'm not originally from Birmingham like that, but this is the most prideful high school place I've ever been in my life. Um, and and that's exactly how it is. What, what high school you went to? Oh, it, it, it don't don't be from the other side, right? <laughs> you, you might catch all kinds of words, but one thing that I really really in, in and proud of a Birmingham is is its history. Um, um, it took me a while to learn it. Um, you know, besides just the civil rights stuff that I already knew, but living in this city and then working at the Civil Rights Institute and then learning those personal intricate stories from foot soldiers and people who've been around and people who um, rub elbows with Dr. King and and it's just this city has an immense amount of history. Parker High School's history, you know, Parker High School is where um is where the the high school um i'm in the high school the um the hbcu college band um uh halftime band show experience started you know i told some uab students today i gave a tour and i had to tell them that like let me tell you about your city right because i mean it's my city now i'm gonna I'm I'm take it on you know take it because this is home for me now but just some of those things that people just don't know erskine hawkins and and uh and fess watley and and Nat King Cole and, and the Carver Theater and the Masonic Temple. You know, a lot of these things, um, if you don't pay attention, you just really won't know. But if you're somebody like me who's inquisitive and, and, and curious and wants to learn about this city and, and it had the opportunity to talk to original foot soldiers and people of that nature, this is probably one of the most rich um, cities when it comes to history. Uh, probably throughout the South. Now, you know, I'm not going to compare it to like Boston and New York, those places that were here, like, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, colonial age or, or New Orleans, which is really old as well. But just the history that Birmingham has that's unique of its own and very broad and um, and has their, 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 their foot in almost every aspect of, of what is American history as well. Um, it's really cool to me. And I want to add something. Um, I appreciated uh, David Dada's quote from the book. It was good to have a leader from UAB uh, talk about uh, the longstanding tension uh, in, in the UAB community about how UAB should be viewed. And I have been on a curriculum committee at UAB where, you know, one time we had a rather tense conversation about Birmingham and how central it should be to the undergraduate curriculum. And I appreciate um, this particular department for sponsoring this. I appreciate David Dada and, and laying the groundwork for this program because sadly enough, UAB, uh, Birmingham is still a place of shame for many people. People are of rightfully concerned about poverty, crime, and we know people like Sheriff Petway are at the front of trying to address those issues. I have lived in other cities. There's not many cities I know of that don't have those concerns, and they're very real, and we have to address them. But I once said at a meeting that, you know, if you're going to be ashamed of Birmingham and you don't want to be a part of it, then you, you may as well take the B out of UAB. I mean, we're the University of Alabama at Birmingham, period. And so I, we need to embrace it as a part of the curriculum. And I'm so glad to see the young people. I, I generally don't have young people balking at that idea, but some, some of our uh, UAB co uh, community members, I think we need to be more reflective and think about how we can um, try to embrace the city a lot more. Absolutely. And I will say I'm not originally from Birmingham either, but I think one of the things that I'm proudest of is how diverse Birmingham is and how we are welcoming that every day more and more. And unfortunately, this is going to be our last question, but we would like to leave time for each of our panelists to answer this question. So if everyone could kind of chime in. How did your college experiences shape your passions and your career choices? And how can students use their experiences to make an impact in the community? Uh, I will say my college experiences shaped my uh, professional career tremendously. Like I, uh, the place where I serve as deputy director, the mayor's office division of youth services now I volunteered with this office when I was uh, beginning when I was a sophomore uh, at UAB. 
and was able to connect with them all throughout my uh, sophomore and junior and senior year. And then the first place, my first job ever out of undergrad was interning with the mayor's office division of youth services. Then I came back to work at UAB. And uh, now I'm, you know, after I got my master's in public administration, I'm now serving as a, uh, the deputy director of the place I used to intern. And that was all through like, you know, really, and I didn't know what happened that way. I had no concept of knowing that would happen, but uh, UAB gave me a lot of opportunities and being in Birmingham did. So I encourage students to follow your passions. Don't just do what you think is popular or what everyone else might be doing. Like really follow what you, you know, your talents, your interests, and your opportunities. I always tell people that. Like your talents, everybody's got talents, everybody has interests. Opportunities come and go, but you always, if you stay ready, you won't have to get ready. So just follow those three. That's what I'll say. Um, I, I like to say that um, and when I first got there, you know, that's my one college, uh, black college in the in the in the country for getting African American students into medical school. And so I was going for the money. And so I, I, I went through down there. I was I was majoring in biology. Um, I wanted to be a physician assistant program. And then my uncle told me, he said, why do you want to be a physician assistant and do all the work and not get paid as a doctor? And so then <laughs> so then I said, well, you know what? I think I'm going I'm to change things. And when I got to school, um, that first semester report card was not very well. It was not very good. I mean, um, my biology scores were low. Chemistry wasn't even that much better. But my history scores were like excellent. And and I've always loved history. I just never thought you can make any money at it. And so um, I had to, I changed my major the second semester of my freshman year to history um, with a minor in African-American studies and political science. And um, and I think it really changed the, the, the whole trajectory of not only my own mental state, but also where, where, I'm, where I was going. And I always felt like I was an educator um, did some school teaching, never got a chance to teach history. Um, I've, I've taught several times and never uh, got a chance to teach history because you teach what they need you to do, you know, what they need you to teach. And and so the passion that I have for for my history, for Black history, for um, African history, for comparative religion, um, for a lot of these different things that I see myself in, but I always didn't see myself in, if that makes sense. Um, that was my passion. So my passion became, let's find that black experience in everything that I'm dealing with, whether it's the Bible, whether it's, um, you know, sports, whether, you know, whatever I'm dealing with, the, let's find the black experience so that, I, so I can feel like I'm a part of, or at least I have a knowledge base that's a part of. And so um, my passion was, was, was for black history. And, and it took a long time for me to be able to, to function in that. Um, when I first moved to Birmingham 15, 17 years ago, the first place I looked for a job was the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. They weren't hiring. These are one of these positions that people, when they get in there, they hold on to them. Um, you know, it's like that, it's like that uh, social studies coach at your high school, right? <laughs> Once he's in there, it's hard to get him out. He's just in there, right? And so um, it took me a while to get to where I am now, but um, it's always been my passion. And, and, and now I'm, I'm happy that I'm in a, in a position where I can teach. Um, but I get to give the students back to their teachers. Um, I get to inform and then also tell people and teach people what they don't know. Okay, I'll answer that quickly. I uh, made, I went to a liberal arts college. I, I mentioned uh, Birmingham Southern College and um, I, really took advantage of the honors program we had there that was very interdisciplinary. So there's one course that really had an impact on me called the urban experience, where we learned about cities across the country. And my professors, we had one history professor and one political science professor who co-taught the course. And we went to the New Orleans Jazz Fest and we, we just learned about the politics and so forth. So I really enjoyed learning about cities in that course. So that has certainly shaped my interest. But I do wanna tell students, some, some, you, you will reinvent yourself sometimes. So hopefully, you, you might have the privilege to do that. Not everyone has that in their jobs. Um, some people feel stuck in certain jobs, and I want to recognize some social class uh, differences there. But if you have the opportunity to go to college and finish, you may reinvent yourself over time. So I majored in political science and minored in English literature, but. 
I really, similar to uh, Mr. Woods, I really like history quite a bit. So I have a secondary appointment in the Department of History because I really ended up landing in a position that was very interdisciplinary in a school of education, educational foundation. So I draw on historical, political, um, social perspectives, but I just started reading more about history and connecting with historical associations. So you can, don't feel like you will get stuck per se, even if you have, you need to choose a major, hopefully you like it well enough, but you need to finish your degree. And then you keep moving on and you might go to graduate school and pick up on something else you're interested in or take some seminars, but um, it, 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 everything's not static. Uh, you know, your, your college degree does not in this day and time necessarily lock you into one particular career path. I'll be very brief with uh, what I have to say, because uh, I know we have passed a lot of the time, but uh, I went to UAB and when I went out to Black History uh, by Dr. Hotley, Dr. Hotley was my teacher. He was an excellent teacher. Uh, he was my instructor, but I can go back and remember when UAB was just three buildings, building one, building two, building three. UAB has, I mean, it's taken over the South side now. Uh, it really has, and I think it's the largest employer over there. It has really taken over the South side. But when I got to UAB, what really uh, fascinated me and changed me and was had a big effect upon me, I saw people from everywhere, all over from different countries. And I had to learn to deal with people from different nationalities that were different from mine. And I had not been able to do that before. That was something new to me, uh, going to a school like UAB. I didn't finish UAB, but I did go there. I attended there a couple of years. And I uh, had to blend in uh, with a lot of foreign students. And I had appreciation at that time for different cultures, getting to meet different people, uh, not just people that look like me, but other people. And that was something Yuri B was very good at doing, bringing people in from, from the outside. And, uh, I was able to learn the different cultures, cultures of the of, of, of the people that were there, and I really appreciated that. And uh, that's something that is uh, still with me today. And I still love to uh, to try to find out differences of uh, people from all over the world. All right, that concludes tonight's event. I would like to thank each of our panelists and our moderator for taking the time out of their busy schedules to help educate UAB students. We have one more question for our viewers, which should be popping up on the screen now. Please answer this question before you leave and visit the UPB and off-campus student services engaged in Instagram pages for more information on upcoming events. Have a great night, everyone.